<laughs> wow. <laughs> we, we probably probably could have cut that like a, a minute sooner. I, I, I no, don't know. That was great, man. That was great. I, 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 <laughs> I feel like that was a good that was a good spot. I'll probably make a comment like in the outro that like when Patrick was saying come together, he meant probably digitally. Uh, don't go outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go outside. Don't go outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. Uh, this podcast is about psychedelics, typically, um, but generally, the underlying curiosity of the podcast has to do with what the psychedelic experience shows us about being human and alive at this time, what it can show us about who we are and how we show up in the world. And, well, one of the things that has gripped the entire world, every single one of us, uh, to more or less degree over the last couple of weeks is COVID-19. So that's what this podcast is about, this episode anyways. Um, I have no desire to make the podcast a COVID-19 podcast. It will continue to be a psychedelic podcast. Episodes that are recorded after this whole thing uh, blew up a couple of weeks ago. There'll be some stuff about COVID, but episodes beforehand won't have any mention of it whatsoever, but generally I'm going to try to seek to keep this a very psychedelic oriented podcast because I'm sure all of you are getting more than enough enough COVID-19 info. Um, and I hope this podcast will be a little bit of a reprieve while also being a positive um, contributor to the mental, emotional, intellectual, social experience of possibly being locked up and isolated in your house. I released this uh, special COVID-19 update a couple weeks ago or a week ago. Wow, it feels like it was a long time ago, but it was really just a couple days, actually. Um, warning you, you know, it's basically, please don't go outside, you know, wash your hands, this kind of thing. It feels uh, almost trite now because it was like, it feels like things have advanced so intensely since then. Um, but I don't intend to continue putting updates about COVID or my world through the podcast channel. Uh, I will be doing it through Instagram, Instagram stories, however. So if you do want to follow what's happening for me, uh, then you can do so at James W. Gesso on Instagram. If I do start sharing things, I will be doing so over my Instagram stories and not through the podcast channel. Although a little update for you now, physically, I am well. Um, the people I am in a pod with, that includes my partner and my very good friend and housemate, uh, we are all well, and we're doing our best in the midst of all of this. And uh, also, well, it's, I'm just realizing on the video, it looks like really trippy psychedelic because my electric sheep just came on. Hang on. Actually, I'll leave it. So we're doing well, and that's good um, for now anyways. Um and there's no guarantee that we will continue to be well. So I will, through the Instagram, uh, update you on how things are going. But hopefully I will not get sick and no one around me will get explicitly unwell and the podcast will continue into the foreseeable future. So that all said, this podcast is with Patrick Krupa. Uh, Patrick's been on the show a couple of times now. The first time was an accidental podcast. We were supposed to record something, but uh, his video wasn't working, so we just recorded it anyways and turned it into a great conversation, which became uh, a podcast because it was so fun. The next one was about his journey escaping heroin addiction and what it was like to be a heroin addict in the 90s in New York City. And we had actually been planning now um, for probably like six months, eight months to uh, do a uh, like just a chit chat, jump on the show or talk about random topics seemed to go well. The first time we had a great rapport, thought it'd be fun. And it wasn't until now that um, that we managed to get together. And um, he's in New York City. And of course, we wanted to talk about what's most relevant to both of us. And that was COVID-19. So that's uh, that's generally what we talked about actually the entire uh, the entire interview the interview has some laughs and has some jokes we're all still human and humor is a great way to cope and make sense of the world um, but uh, it's also a pretty serious podcast we talk a lot about 
politics and economy and um, society and you know things that seem relevant i mean neither of us are economists uh, or sociologists or professors or or whatever that is so of course take everything we say with a grain of salt but this is what this is us making sense of it and talking with each other uh, there is definitely some discussion about psychedelics and the psychedelic experience um, in this and what it might show us or offer us in navigating these times and uh, the conversation gets to a deeper place of uh, wondering about what it might take or what not what it might take but what might best serve us to keep in mind as we go into these very uncertain times as we are now deep in these uncertain times today is monday the 23rd uh this podcast is coming out on the friday after this monday which is the same day the monday that this was recorded and everything that you hear here might be completely out of date by the time this comes out because things are changing so fast um, but I do hope that what you experience in this podcast um, feels like, especially if you're isolated right now, feels like other people talking about this thing in a real uh, and unapologetic and mindful way, um, because I don't know how much of that you might be getting in your life right now. Uh, before we get into that interview, though, I'm going to send out a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon who continue to support me uh, over the last last while some of you for a few days others of you for more than a year so a big thank you to those patrons um you have made it so that i am yet to, to see the grand consequences of the economic uh downturn that we're experiencing as a world right now so i appreciate that i especially appreciate the people whose names are listed on the screen here on youtube or in the show notes to this episode at jameswjessup.com because uh, they give significantly so thank you very much to those people as well if you're not a patron and you would like to become one, um, if you are not negatively impacted financially by the COVID-19 um, pandemic, then please consider uh, donating, or sorry, donating, but contributing, pledging to the Patreon. And you can go to jameswjessa.com forward slash support for information about doing that. Okay, uh, that's it. Um, I want to say enjoy this episode, but that feels like the wrong thing to say. Uh, I hope that what follows from here is something that feels meaningful and generative in your experience of this right now. Um, and I will see you on the outro. And your audio is good on my end. Like you sound, you sound great. All right. Spectacular. So we're both here. <laughs> happy, happy Armageddon and apocalypse now. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. The hashtag Corona apocalypse is upon us. <laughs> All right. How are you doing, brother? Uh, are you dealing with this? <laughs> well, I'm dealing with it pretty well. Like I've been, I, I mean, I wasn't last week, honestly, even though I've kind of had a sense that this was coming. My housemate's been following it since, uh, I think since December or January. It was around January that he started talking about this thing happened in China that he thinks might turn into a big deal. And uh, it was, I had been hearing him talk about it, but I was like, I trust that you are thinking about this clearly and you are checking your sources and it's also still so far away. And until I need to worry about it, I'll just continue to learn from you and also not take it too seriously because we don't know yet. And then it got to a point in like uh, early March when we, when he was like, I think this is about to get, he said something like, I, I don't know for sure, but I think this is about to get bad. And I suspect that we'll know how bad it's going to get. Um, if, it, if it's going to get bad, we're going to get a sense of it in the next two weeks. Um, and then within a week, it was like things were already ramping up and, you know, two weeks after the beginning of March and we're essentially, you know, that was last week. That's when things got crazy here in Canada insofar as government response. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until middle of maybe, maybe like five days ago, four days ago that I really started being like, okay, up until that point, I was, I was scared, man, anxious. I feel like I'm in this like weird like, you know, those experiences when you're high on psychedelics, part of me, when I'm high on psychedelics, sometimes, especially with LSD, I'll go into this world in my mind that is rich and complex and I'm living in it. And the implications, like the existential degree of implication is just so significant. It's undeniably real. And then there'll be a moment when all of a sudden it'll feel less real. And then it's shortly after it starts to feel less real that I come to and I'm like, whoa, none of that existed. I'm just sitting on my couch. And every now and yeah. then I feel like there are these moments where it's starting to slip in, like that it's like, is this real? Like, is this happening? But 
as of a couple of days ago, I managed to find some sort of temporary uh, sturdiness in the midst of the uncertainty because I'm locked down, not like by the government, but we have a very tight group right now, tight isolation pod or distance pod. And with my partner, with my one of my best friends, and we're holding down. I'm not sick yet. Um, I might have had Corona like two weeks ago, but I don't know because, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, so that's, that's like everybody. It's like, was that the flu? Was that Corona? What, what happened here? And it's like, it, it's very hard to tell. Yeah. It's, uh, in, in New York, it's become very, very weird because it's like, uh, okay, there was, there was China, there's Italy, then New York is just humongous. And I have a, I mean, I have a lot of friends, uh, undoubtedly the same as you, that are scattered all over the globe, and everyone has a slightly different response to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much everyone is mellow, but it's uh, th there's a lot of people who just really haven't noticed at all. And it's just okay, whatever, <laughs> just gonna chill out, have fun, and uh, it it it's uh, it hasn't quite sunk in yet, but it's like every government on planet Earth is pretty much uh, responding in some manner, and uh, well, we're we're all living in this interesting time frame right now with mm -hmm. this happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, yeah, init uh, initially we had we had gotten on the call. We we're going to talk about the psychedelic Renaissance. I was going to ask you some stuff. I mean, some stuff that's maybe still relevant, but it's like. I don't intend in the podcast to make every episode from here on in about about COVID nineteen. No, but, okay. But <laughs> but, I, was <laughs> but uh, I mean, it is still Very a psychedelic topic. podcast. But I mean, for the time being, it makes sense. Like this is coming out on on Friday from the time it's recording it. You know, by Friday, things that we talk about might be totally irrelevant at this point, uh, or at that point. But uh, it seems to make sense to talk about it now. I'd be curious to hear more about what's happening in New York because, from what I understood, you're going into you were going into total lockdown. Um, it hasn't quite arrived at that, that level. I mean, the mayor in New York City appears to be pushing for that. And Cuomo, who's uh, the governor in New York, is pushing back against that. So uh, it uh, basically the National Guard got called in, though. I mean, that occurred within the last 24 hours. I think Trump did that. So ostensibly that's to help with medical supplies and ventilators and uh, the face masks and all that and uh, hopefully uh, things get resolved in some sort of uh, some sort of manner that is does the least amount of damage I mean the stock market has walked off a fucking cliff I mean that 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 but that's an abstraction the, the real part is if Nobody on planet Earth can go anywhere, or do anything, and everyone's basically forced to stay home. I mean, for many of us, we uh, we sort of exist in a reality that isn't coupled to going out and having having a job and getting paid and doing X, Y, and Z out there in the in the that that place called consensual reality. And uh, you know, we're we're sort of coexisting in this uh, this part of the multiverse. And but but the reality is, a lot of people, you know, live from paycheck to paycheck. So suddenly you're not getting paid. Everything is shut down, and you don't have any food. You don't have any money. You don't have any ability to actually go anywhere. Then what happens? And it becomes very interesting. I mean, in, in New York City, oddly enough, pretty much everybody I know who lives there, it's like, okay, are you going to get out of there if it's locked down? Are you going to stay there? And the, the response has pretty universally been, I'd rather be locked inside of New York City than outside, not going. Mm -hmm. And okay, what, whatever works for people. And um, but by the time they're like, you know, it's a couple of days later, though. It's like I'm sitting in my really small apartment in New York City. <laughs> I'd like to get out of here and go someplace else and do something. And uh, I mean, I get what they're doing, which is flattening the curve, because, I mean, if everybody gets it all at once, the healthcare system will be completely overloaded. And I believe it's already reaching that state in New York. It's mm -hmm. pretty bad right now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't uh, actually know how bad it is because... I imagine they're not testing every person. And the thing is, is that it was what, like last week, maybe last week that New York all of a sudden was like, oh shit, coronavirus, like we need to take it really seriously. <laughs> and so that means, that means like the people who I, realize, I 
Yeah, <laughs> go for it. Better than the smoking, right? Um, the people yeah, smoking, who smoking, no, just vapor. just vapor. The, the... Uh, the, the people who, uh, you know, that this week who are like, whoa, I have coronavirus are, I mean, depending on the are not like the number of people you infect essentially once you have it, that means that all the people who are saying, oh shit, I have coronavirus, which is thousands of people in, in New York. Is that correct? That means that there's there's at least twice that many, um, if not more. And if whatever, if you have and and that's likely going to grow because then there are still people who don't know unless social isolation takes over. But we won't even see the result of social distancing like we're having it here in Canada, like you guys are you know, doing your best to practice in New York for another three weeks at least. So we'll just see the numbers keep exponentially rising. And as, as the cases exponentially rise, so do the deaths. And then as the number of people who need hospitalizations rise and like the degree of... Um, like the, the availability of ventilators becomes less and less. People who would survive had they gotten ventilators will now die. doesn't matter what age you are. You're more likely when you're 80, but you're just as likely to have complications. Well, you are also very likely to have complications in 20 and 30. And if you don't get a ventilator because there's no ventilators, then you die. And then, then there'll be even more, like once you run out of ventilators, like the, the increase of deaths just jumps dramatically because for every person that doesn't get one that would have survived now that they die so that that like one to uh, you know two the two percent all of a sudden becomes maybe three and four or five percent depending on how many people are sick at once and it it might end up getting very very crazy everywhere but like in new york especially because there are so many cases that are already existing yeah i mean i think it's been here for a while and the cases did not magically come you know, they didn't arrive like 24 hours ago or three days ago. It's just New York finally started testing for what was already here. Mm-hmm. So I think it's pretty much spread out all over the place. And I think it's heading for, towards middle America. And I know it's it's hitting uh, Vancouver. It's hitting Seattle. And uh, I guess we will we'll see what what happens with all of it. I mean, it's a pretty unique situation. And uh, it uh I mean, actually looking at the data, how how scary is it? And the answer is, well, I mean, it's not exactly the plague. It's not that horrifying. But what what the problem is, is, again, healthcare services getting overrun. And uh, I mean, this is the narrative that is pretty much uh, absorbing everybody's focus right now. Right, from, from curve, one, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> from, from one way or another. And uh, it's... Uh, well, it's an interesting time. I yeah. mean, we, we haven't ever lived through anything quite exactly like this so far. So, One of the things well, that uh, we've been talking about in my, like we're seeing, I'm still seeing other people, you know, like we're meeting up outside and keeping like at least a two meter distance so we could at least have conversations with each other or like they, like my neighbors walk past, they're on the boardwalk, I'm up in my house four meters away <laughs> and talking, you know, kind of thing. Um, yeah. But one of the things is like, you know, this is, on some sense, this is started, uh, hopefully the only equivalent we will have in our generation as like our great war. You know, the difference being that we are much more switched on insofar as like a complexity of access to information uh, than the our generation and the generations that were in World War Two and World War One, And also it's not one side versus the other. It's basically all of humanity versus the the destructive consequences of our own irresponsibility as a as a globalized um uh consumer consumer capital cap, capitalist consumerism civilization and, and an extractivist civilization because these this virus would not exist if the breeding grounds for it had not been created over generations of geopolitical economic um behaviors that drove wet markets in China to even exist in the way that they do and yeah. for the population density to exist the way that they do for us to have so much business happening all over the world where people are flying back and forth constantly and sharing everything around massive amounts of flights and all the rest. So it's like, I feel like this is us collectively needing to face up and deal with the destructive consequences of our irresponsibility as an entire civilization. And this isn't even climate change yet. You know, and this is our warm up stress test, <laughs> yeah. right? 
I, for, from a personal perspective, I'm really happy about the, the flying part. I've set a personal world record for the least amount flown, like in the last 10 years for me. So it's like, all right, fuck yeah, I don't have to get on planes. It's great. Um, that, yeah. that, part, that, that part is nice. But um, it, it's all of planet Earth. And again, the question is, well, will the airlines be there a couple of months later? And, uh, you know. The, the price of oil has walked off a cliff and it's just basically everything is tanking. So we're going to hit, uh, we're, we're going from, you know, all time highs to hitting a recession, possibly a depression and uh, a, a question of how do you handle that out in the real world. So, you know, the Fed has restarted quantitative easing. They're going to take every possible measure to sort of, uh, keep everything moving along and moving forward but it's a it's a significant issue when there's so many people on planet earth who um just can't go to work can't do anything and you're basically stuck in your house and then what if you what if you can't get food and on, on the flip side of that we're very clever so we'll figure out a way to uh to to create a vaccine, but it's not even so much a vaccine as something that uh, may have efficacy for addressing the specific problems that the COVID creates. And uh, all of that is a, a little bit hazy at this exact moment in time, but I, I'm pretty confident that we will figure it all out. But it's, uh, it's definitely a massive change for everybody because it's like what Last week, the world was more or less normal, or you know, 10 days ago it was, and now it's like where we're at right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like uh, like even even now, given that the rates of change are so intense, like I said, like the what we're talking about in this conversation might be completely irrelevant by the time I post it on Friday. You know, we might know, <laughs> we might be in a totally different world by then, which is kind of scary because Stephen Jenkinson, a guy that I've been following for a while, talks about... Um, dying people, you never know when someone's really going to, they can't say definitely this is when a person's going to die, but they can approximate it reliably based on the rate of change. And so if someone's yeah. symptoms are changing significantly once a month, then they got months to live, you know, weeks, weeks to live, days, days to live, and so on and so forth until it's by the minute. And it's like, okay, this is the time. And he also says that what we're seeing is a civilization in the speeding up of rates of change in our personal lives and in civil and in our like sort of larger global lives is the dying of our civilization. And it kind of feels like, Holy shit. Like this is, this is it. Like it's, <laughs> I mean, that's not to say that we're all going to die, but what we knew of, of the civilization before COVID, you know, is not going to be what exists afterwards. It's, it's dying right now. And we're going to try to birth something new out of it. And maybe it's, something closer to universal basic income or something like that. Maybe it's something where despite the fact that people have been arguing for it for a very long time, you know, that it's not responsible to continue to leverage our entire economies on these incredibly unstable industries that are based on extraction of finite resources with the intention of infinite growth, like airlines, oil industry, all the rest. That possibly it's like, oh, yeah, oh, shit, all it took was a virus, a not even a particularly deadly virus, not even, a, you know, like it compared to SARS-1, SARS-2 doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's not as intense on the yeah. body, but because it spreads so fast, it kills more people, it overwhelms, blah, 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 we talk about that. So it's like, we're seeing that none of these things are working. They are dying away. There's no way we, we can go back to them from here. And fingers crossed, the other side is the birth of something better, of like team human. Yeah. Alternatively, the other side might be the dystopian totalitarian nightmare that, you know, that Orwell talked about that the conspiracy well, yeah. theorists have been have been proclaiming for since <laughs> since conspiracy. I, theories I, I'm not going to go in that direction because I've got so many friends from the technology sector who are OK, that's the beginning. It's a. Uh, that we're going to have a biosecure society. Was this an accident? No, it was engineered. And there's like, OK, a lot of people have a lot of different crazy theories about what it all means and how it is manipulated. But at, at the end of the day, I just think it's something that happened and all of us have to deal with the fallout and the consequences from it. And I'm hopeful, much as you, that a kinder, gentler society will emerge and uh Universal basic income is something that would be a reasonable start 
considering the fact that, okay, everybody is sitting in their houses and, you know, you're not allowed to go anywhere and do anything. And uh, it, it could be the birth of something significantly better. And that would be, that would be an amazing thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To do. Fingers crossed, I guess, but it definitely is like, and maybe you can agree with me here. It is forcing, I mean, given that you're, if you're not in a situation where you're living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck, and as a consequence of not being allowed to go to work, you're just basically staring down the barrel of poverty within the next week or something. Assuming that you're somebody for one reason or another has a little bit of leverage between stopping working and being in poverty, but you're not allowed to go out and do anything slash, I mean, anyone who's paying attention, you're, if you think that it's okay to go out and do something, chances are you're wrong. <laughs> That's foolish. You're hurting, you're <laughs> potentially going to really hurt yourself and hurt a lot of people as a consequence of that. Um, but like, it's just slowing things down. And all of a sudden it really is like, whoa, living moment to moment. I don't know what the next day is going to mean for my life. And that's a very interesting state of mind to be in somewhat akin to being in a psychedelic experience. Like I can't control any of this and all I can do is just like breathe and try to attend to what's happening in the most sort of like humble, you know, humble way possible and lean into my safety resources as much as possible in the process, which is, you know, the other people we're with in this, which is everybody, you know? Yeah. That's, that's kind of like the, the, the bottom line. It's like all of us are in this together. All of us are trying to uh, see where where it leads to. And uh, people do have varying responses. I mean, I, I there's a lot of people who are just not paying attention to it at all. It's like, I'm on a beach. I'm getting drunk. I'm having a party. Why are people bothering me and making me go get inside? That's that's Miami, by the way. Right yeah, now, oh, I saw that video. Oh, my having. God. I was so disgusted oh. and terrified. No, it's it, people just aren't really paying attention, though, dude. It's just like, okay, the world is ending. Your attention, please. It's like, what? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It, well, I mean, fake uh, fake news and, and and the way the way that the media has encouraged people to think and how much fake news and misreporting and the sort of like the you know the big show of of mainstream media and and especially in in. I mean, in, in Canada too, for sure. But I feel like, and this could be ignorant, especially in America and certain places in America, that people are sort of like uh, conditioned by the media to not really pay too close attention to anything of particular value unless they're told to, while simultaneously losing more and more respect for the mainstream institutions. So then all of a sudden it's like, the boy who cried wolf and CNN and, and uh, Fox news are, and even Donald Trump is saying, this is serious, go inside. And at this point, everyone's like, ah, whatever you're, they're just, they're just the mainstream. You're just blowing it up. It's just, it's a hoax. It's blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, you know, like the thing that gave Trump his capacity to, you know, capture the minds of, of, of his, his constituency is the same thing that's making it so that they're not listening to him now when he's actually being like, uh, actually it's really serious. Uh, we need you to stay inside and it, and it's, yeah, especially with the youth, you know, like we were, we were brought up to be like, fuck the system. And so when the system says stay inside, we say party on. Right. Well, right. Exactly. Because we essentially live in 1984. What's real. It's very difficult to pull out the threads from this giant narrative and, uh, ascertain what is actually happening anywhere on planet Earth. But, but I'm pretty sure that most of Earth has, uh, you know, come together on the narrative that, narrative that uh, COVID is real and that it's a good idea to stay inside at this point. Yeah, I, I, should, I, I should hope so. <laughs> people in my bubble uh, absolutely are and seemingly people in your bubble as well. Yeah, yeah. That's it's a lot of different bubbles, but I think everyone agrees that it's real at this point. It's no longer just this this random thing. And it's uh, it's an amazing time in uh, in the history of planet Earth in terms of psychedelics, which is sort of like the 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 overarching theme and the you know, the what 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 sort of brings us all together or sort of is the backdrop for this story of change that, that people can uh, transform from where they're at to a 
better place, a better state, and in this case, I guess, take the whole world with us mm-hmm. because there's there's no other choice except to change. And what's you know what I, what I think about a lot is uh, well, gratitude that uh, I was able to leave behind the, the, the life that I was in, uh, you know, in the past, uh, because right now everyone who's a drug dependent individual on top of all the problems that you're facing that all of us face right now, you have an epic mountain of just shit raining down on you because you have to go out there. And if you're on methadone maintenance, if you're dependent on, uh, molecules, fentanyls, all of this stuff. I mean, all of it, th- there are limited supplies out there, but all of it is going to evaporate. And uh, really, most of the people I know who are still drug dependent individuals, that's their number one concern. It's just like, I am going to be really, really sick, never mind COVID. It's just like, I'm going to run out of everything that I need to carry me from day to day. And, um, it, it, it's just a very giant uh, drop and everything, well, everything is out of control, but everything is always out of control. It's just kind of accepting that <laughs> sort of surfing through chaos and trying to trying to find a destination. And uh, it, it's, it, it is what it is, but we're, we seem to be moving towards a better place. So that part is, that part is good. And, um, yeah. yeah, all of this is just uh, all the different material that comes in from the people I talk to, because I have uh, a lot of different peer groups from, you know, there's there's technology, there's there's the, you know, the psychedelics people that there there's all these different groups and everyone is concerned for slightly, slightly different reasons. But I think those who are most impacted are people living in poverty and people who are drug dependent. And those two tend to be interrelated a lot of the time. And it's, uh, you know, that's a scary time because that's not the top of anyone's priority list. Oh, this guy's going to be dope sick. It's like, more, you know, here's a bunch of people who are dying. So, oh, well, and they're not really that worried about it. And that's, that's another factor that plays into New York City and, you know, any densely populated region where there are a lot of drug dependent individuals all in one, one sort of contained sort of space, one area. It's, uh, I don't know. It's a lot of chaos right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I I appreciate you say that, Patrick, because honestly, I I didn't think about that at all. Like, I, I did I did consider you know people who are um like there are more at risk populations, so people living in poverty or homeless, they don't have places to wash their hands. For example, no. they're I mean, generally, they're people who are homeless are likely homelessness is also wrapped up in some sort of mental illness. And the capacity to actually like not to care for your contagiousness, whatever it might be, is not there, you know? So I I thought about that. Once it enters into the homeless population, it's going to spread like wildfire because they don't have the opportunity to stay inside and not interact with each other or wash their hands, right? But then I hadn't also considered that there's with you know just outside of that isn't is the at-risk population of people who might even be like you had said in in one of our other interviews still maintaining a locus of control over their substance dependence but it still requires them to go out into the street or to have somebody come to their house who is seeing lots of people or and at some point that supply is gone so they're either at risk for contracting covid because they're interacting in in a hotbed of it or they're now at risk of getting dope sick and eventually becoming another part part in the term, but like burden on the healthcare system in the sense of like another weight pulling down on our resources. I'm going to scratch the burden thing. It doesn't feel good to say it, but another weight that's like pulling that we're trying to hold up as our in our healthcare system that jeopardizes a yeah. There's a, I, I hadn't considered that, and I appreciate you bringing that into my frame. Yeah. Um, certainly I, I consider it, uh, pretty frequently cause I just know a lot of people who are directly impacted by that. So they sort of, 
bring it to the forefront of my thoughts. But really, you know, in Canada, at least you have a pretty enlightened healthcare system and everyone seems to have at least a basic level of, of health care. In the United States, that is that is not the case, uh, albeit, again, emergency measures are, you know, taking taking form and hopefully people will have uh, have something to to fall back on. But it's uh, it, it it's all. It, it, it all is what, what, what it is, and we will get through it simply through the passage of time. I mean, from my personal experience, China, uh, Shanghai in particular, okay, it was right before Chinese New Year, everything went dark. If you try to contact individuals there in various industries, people in different labs, if you if you try to touch base, suddenly it lights out, nothing. Everything just falls into oblivion. All of them came back online about a week ago. So suddenly people are picking up the phones, people are responding, and these are you know people who are distributors of labs who deal with molecules. And when you talk to them, where are you at? It's like, well, we're pretty much living in the aftermath. It's it's over and done with, and whatever whatever happened, happened, and everyone has either already been exposed to it and they've, their immune system beat it down, or it, it seems to be more or less life is like back to normal. But they also quarantined a huge amount of people in China, which is not something that the U.S. is going to have that much luck with. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not just the U.S. I mean, I have friends in Germany, which appears to be impacted significantly. The European Union is, I mean, it's just all of planet Earth. So from right now to roughly three to four months from now is when uh, we'll see where planet Earth is at and what is, what is the state of the world at that point in time, because uh, whatever critical mass is happening, it will have it will have occurred and hopefully we will uh, manage to flatten the curve, which actually is a reasonable response. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone I've spoken with from, with in a, from a medical or scientific uh, perspective disagrees with that. I think there's pretty much absolute unity and okay, try to prevent, prevent yourself from getting it because if everyone gets it all at once, it's a lot worse than if you're, you're, we have the capacity to deal with people in smaller waves and that's about all we can, all we can really do with it. And mm -hmm. with, um, you know, people processing what's happening, I guess it's, uh, that that's something else altogether. I mean, that's, uh, you know, everyone is, uh, experiencing their own version of, you know, can you sit still and be with yourself or better yet? Can you sit still and be with five different people and have, not have them drive you crazy if you're yeah. still sitting there weeks later? Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it, it's an ex interesting experiment. And in, in, in a way, parts of it could be cool because, I mean, we're all online. We're all talking to each other. We're having this conversation right now. So it's not like everybody is isolated and sitting in their house by themselves, as, as you pointed out, I mean, we have much greater access to technology and communications right now than in any other point within human history. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping for the best and that's, that's really all that we can do. And I, 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 th I think that, Planet Earth will will be all right, and hopefully a little bit improved even after after it's all all is said and done, and it's sort of moved onwards. And, um, mm -hmm. What are what are your thoughts uh, or closing thoughts or yeah? What Canada basically? What what part of Canada do you live in? I mean, I know you travel to to Vancouver a lot, but you're on the east coast, right? Where well, you reside, I'm, on, you... I'm on the e eastern side of Canada compared to Vancouver, you know, like when you're in Vancouver, anything like east of Manitoba is east, eastern Canada, you know, right? Um, but I'm in Ontario, which is actually one of the epicenters of our outbreak. Um, Vancouver, BC, and also uh, Ontario, in particular Toronto, and I live about 90 minutes out of Toronto. Um, <clears throat> your comment there about uh, Canada having a better healthcare system than the United States is true, period. Um, although that, that it doesn't mean that we actually, we are bulletproof right now or that things are necessarily no, going well, is. right? Because, um, 
for sure, if I get sick with COVID and I go to the hospital, then, and I survive and I come out the other end two weeks after two weeks on a ventilator or whatever, try, you know, with IVs and catheters plugged into me so that I don't die. And I come out the other end, not dead, but then grappling with the consequences, I won't have $35,000 debt just simply right. for getting medical care. I won't. However, uh, Canada's standard of care, although higher is, uh, and I'll use this term clearly here and intentionally burdened by excessive bureaucracy. Now that excessive bureaucracy sustains the system, but then it also ends up, there ends up being like a lot of like wasted. There's a whole thing like uh, of like wasted funds and, and poorly delivered services and long wait times and all the rest. And it's also difficult to implement things like China. You said China could go into total shutdown because China is basically an author is an authoritarian government. If China says it's jump, an autocracy. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't jump. have any, <laughs> if you stay, it says stay inside, you stay inside because you go to prison if you don't or whatever. Right. So you can't do that in the United States. You got too many people with guns, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> but, <laughs> yeah, <we do>. but <laughs> in Canada, it's similar because we can't just say stay inside. We have to say, this is so Canadian. Like, could you please stay inside? Eh? you know, but yeah. that, which is what the, what Trudeau is saying, but he's also being like, look, please stay inside. Because the next step from here is the Emergency Measures Act. And then once, or I think that's what it's called, as soon as he implements that, well, then we're in wartime, at which point he can restrict anyone's travel in any place within Canada, which means closing provincial borders, which means you can't leave your house, which means curfews, which means all the rest. Um, so that might happen. But insofar as our health care, um, like the, there are two hospitals in the city that I live in. One of them is Grand River, the other one's St. Mary's. A report came out the other day that about 50 registered nurses were exposed, potentially exposed to COVID-19 at St. Mary's Hospital. And this was like four days ago. And one of the things that's like, okay, this is what collapses the healthcare system. Because of course, okay, we have number of cases increasing, which means you have number of cases needing uh, medical support increasing, which means we have a load on the healthcare system. Eventually that load overruns and we don't have ventilators for everyone. And doctors have to make the choice between like who gets a ventilator and who dies based on what's their life context. Do they have kids or are they single? Are they a 50 year old who's playing an important role as a grandfather inside of a family of a single mother? Or is it a 45 year old who is single with no kids? Which one are we going to let die? Right? So it's like, that's intense, but it gets even more intense because the more influx and chaos in the system the more likely the healthcare workers get sick. And now it's not just that we don't have enough ventilators, we don't have enough nurses. And then the nurses yeah. are getting sick. So now we are lessening our capacity while increasing our load. And so that. right, this is part of this is part of the challenge. So of course you want to protect healthcare workers first and foremost, right? Or not first and foremost, but it's really important to protect healthcare workers. They yeah. are the front line of this of this battle against this virus, right? Um and yet because our supplies in Canada, in Ontario in particular, is so limited here in Canada, in Ontario, our premier, which is sort of like, um, I mean, it's a senator that runs the state in the United States, right? Is that is that correct? Like the head of the state is the senator? Is that how that goes? Uh, uh, the governor is usually like that. Governor, the, okay. It's, uh, governor is Cuomo for New York. And uh, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm slightly more familiar with, with uh, Canada's political system than I was a few years ago, but yeah. Okay. Good. So, so our, our like equivalent of a governor would be our provincial leader, our premier, and the premier is in relationship with the prime minister. So all the Canada is essentially a federation of provinces and there are different levels yeah. of jurisdiction from, you know, from federal down into provincial, down into municipal or, or county level um, governments. And each one's have managed different things and each one gets money from different places and managing different infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. So our sort of like head, is a guy named Doug Ford, who is the brother of Rob Ford, the famous Toronto D Mayor Doug Cut, Ford is a phenomenal human being, by the way, just to give my personal uh, impression of him. He's a really good guy. I mean, Are this you is serious? Spoken. Yes. He's, I mean, I don't know what he does with himself. I don't know what he does, like, in Canada. I don't know what the perception of him is, but he was extraordinarily receptive to uh, both Ibogaine, psychedelic treatments in general, and... I, I believe you just pointed out his brother was was Rob uh, Ford who had a who who got caught smoking crack. Significant, 
Right. Significant yeah. substance abuse problems. Yeah, so he yeah. sort of has a very open mind, open heart towards uh, psychedelic treatments and Ibogaine. That's the only area where I directly have interacted with him and well, known him. I don't know him. I don't know what the rest of his history is. but Well, that's, that's very that's interesting it. because I, I don't know that side of the man. I see the side of the man who, from our, many of the perspective of people living in Ontario, he's sort of like our Trump light. You know, he he, really? he campaigned he's... on don't worry, you know, I won't cut any jobs, but I'll I'll reduce the deficit by like reducing unnecessary spending. But he also like leveraged something like he's gonna bring in a buck of beer policy, you know, like like Doug a buck of beer Ford kind of thing. And then when he came in, it turned out a lot of his campaign things were lies. He started cutting all these fundings and jobs from social services, education, healthcare um uh, social services like child care all the rest things were just getting gutted uh in a in an absolutely abysmal way similar to i mean similar to what i understand trump kind of did so it's interesting that when it was about him and his he was all compassion and whatever but when it came to running the province he didn't care about that he cared about finance he was very very conservative in that sense but anyways um right now uh, he, I don't, I don't know what he's doing right now. I haven't checked in today <laughs> in particular, but he is efforting to do things that it's like, we're all in this tough situation and he's efforting towards like reducing the cost for staying at home. He has shut things down. He issued a state of emergency. So I'm appreciating the way he's showing up to it. But the way that the medical system is happening right now, Trudeau is claiming that we have everything that we need because he's, he's, he's sidestepping questions about whether or not we're going to buy medical supplies from China and other places. He's saying, no, we have what we need, plus the industries are being established in order to provide what we need. And yet, we don't actually have the medical supplies that we need. And here in Ontario, and I'm about to explain the 50 nurses thing, here in Ontario, I've gotten word from other people who are working in the hospitals that access to N95 masks are so limited that you don't actually have access to them. You have to go through protocol and bureaucracy to get them. And so... We don't have enough masks. We do have apparently a million N95s left over from SARS-1, but they have to be checked to make sure they're viable before they're released into healthcare. That's That makes sense. But because of that, this hospital said you weren't allowed to wear the masks unless it was a COVID case and somebody came in with the flu and they weren't allowed to test for COVID because there aren't enough tests either. And so it turned out later that this guy had the flu and he had come into contact with more than 50 registered nurses because of the way the bureaucracy of the hospital was being run under the orders of like how to conduct it, from what I understand, but based on the provincial regulations right now around the masks and stuff, they we could be losing 50 nurses and they can't work yet because it's taking more than seven days to get a test back because it's so backlogged. So on the surface, it looks like, wow, Trudeau is really handling it super well. And on, but on the inside, it's like, we're almost at the point where we have to, we should be afraid. And our cases haven't even blown up yet. Right. We're on that exponential curve as much as you guys are. We just have that. Our numbers are just lower. Right. But we're yeah. still headed in the same direction as far as we know yet. Cause we haven't seen, the, flat, the social distancing come into effect. Um, and likely we're going to move towards some type of like some type of quarantine shutdown within the next couple of weeks, given the direction and the trajectory of the cases at this point. I, I think that's identical to, to New York. And I mean, what you pointed out with the uh, medical personnel, first responders, all these people, I mean, they're essentially risking their lives every single day to try and help people. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, well, just cooperating with that effort and doing the best that you can to adhere to uh, social distancing, however difficult that may be, and not contributing to exacerbating the problem and just chilling out and trying to be mellow and stay calm for a while. and. And see what happens and what what you've pointed out with the I mean the lack of the masks the tests the medical system being overloaded I mean New York is a complete disaster I mean if you you know flip through the headlines it's like the number of hospital beds the number of available beds and ICUs I think it's the same story um, pretty much worldwide it's just decreased over the decades everything has been cut by one politician or another politician it's not like any specific regime was better or any specific individual did a great job it's all of them cut it everyone who went, went through it okay cut this cut that and 
Um, New York, I had no effective tests whatsoever up until about a week ago. To my mm-hmm. understanding, it, it was just like, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, um, we need more tests, and they finally got them. And it's like like we talked about a while ago, it, it it's not that suddenly all these cases magically appear, they're just finally testing what has already been here. And at this point, they're basically kind of stopping. They're, they're essentially saying, if you have symptoms of COVID, if you have the symptoms of a flu, just stay at home and don't spread it. Don't show up and get a test because all you will do is expose additional medical personnel to, to the possibility of getting infected. If you're experiencing significant side effects and you're really sick, seek medical attention, but don't just show up and get tests. Mm-hmm. That's the message that's, that, that we're getting as a whole in New York anyway. Which is something similar to what's happening here. Like when I call to, I'm like, yo, what's up? Like I had laryngitis, <laughs> I've never had laryngitis in my life, you know, once when I was a teenager, but I went from having a sore throat to spontaneously being unable to speak. And if I did speak, I'd cough, but I had no other symptoms, <laughs> you know? And it's yeah. like, okay, sure. It might not have been COVID. Nobody's reported laryngitis as a part of COVID, but at the same time, 80% of people have mild symptoms of a vast majority of them or mild symptoms means not killing you, requiring hospitalization symptoms. A vast majority of those, some of them have no symptoms whatsoever, still carriers. Some people, only 13% have sore throats. Maybe I was part of the, this even lower percentage that only had sore throats. It's like, it's just, it's so weird without testing. It's basically like this weird anything, nothing. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes <laughs> yeah. it isn't anything, right? So it's like, but when I called, they were like, just self-isolate. If you have any symptoms, self-isolate. You know, it's like basically socially distance. And if you have any symptoms, self-isolate. But, you know, you call, you you call and you let them know. So like public health has on record that I called this name, this address, whatever. And if I have, if at any point I had like an emergency response, I call 911 and let them know. Like, and I, I don't know if they have some sort of record where like if someone calls 911, that they'll know that there's COVID in the house because the person called public health or just every case from 911 <laughs> is like showing up in hazmat suits or something, which I mean, makes sense because we got to keep our EMS people safe too. Cause like we need them as yeah. much as we need the registered nurses. Right. So, um, so they're not testing people unless, cause now they can't even run like the nurses. We need to know if they have COVID, but it's still seven yeah. days for them, you know? So it's like, I, I applaud Trudeau for how he's, doing what he's doing with a minority government and not making any of these issues partisan issues and also responding significantly. But I also think that he's responding slowly and the system is basically like being dragged under the weight of its own bureaucracy and it's going to end up being like really negative. And also at the same time, it's like, fuck if he's not doing the absolute best job he can like it's a tough situation to be an innocent leader you can with a minority government and like uh oh my god so it's like in, in a in a so-called free country like to tell people like basically don't leave your house we don't want to have to send the police after you eventually when we right. have to like, right. implement war measures act to try to like so it's it's yeah, yeah i mean it's complicated obviously i'm not a poli sci major or whatever so people can take what i'm saying with it, it comes it comes with a it comes with a vile assault used liberally uh as you hear what i have to say but uh, i mean likewise this is not my area of expertise in general usually both of us talk about oh yeah psychedelics but, <laughs> <laughs> you know actually patrick i want to ask you about that okay so um now i i had asked you in advance if this was okay to talk about your mother passed away recently and i wanted to ask you about um, how that compared from a healthy place in your life. Like you are no longer struggling with substance use. Like you had a, you had a heroin addiction many, many years ago. Um, you, Ibogaine helped you. This is like, you know, a refresh course for people who didn't listen to the other two episodes. Ibogaine helped you, um, get your life back in that sense. And has since you have been a part of a movement to help bring Ibogaine to people and help consult with Ibogaine uh, treatment centers in order helping people to come about. You played an important role in the early science around ibogaine for heroin uh, heroin uh, dependence. And during the time that you were dependent on heroin was in the 90s, sort of like the heroin chic era of New York City. And you watched a lot of your friends die. Um, yeah. Even after you recovered, you know, people 
It's not like all your buddies all recovered too. You know, like you likely yeah. continue to see people dying and you likely continue to see people dying. Maybe not your close friends anymore, but people who you're in that. And my initial question was wondering about how that was different for you in the different stages of what it was like to watch your friends die when you were a heroin addict. Pardon the term. I know it comes with a lot of baggage, but it like addict. I, I, I don't mind that term at all. I mean, you can even say junkie. I mean, without being pejorative about it. I mean, whatever. I mean, William Burroughs found that all right. It's just pick a decade and someone will find a reason <laughs> sure. to get upset about it. Sure. I'll, I'll use addict then. Like, sure. no, okay. Yeah, I'll use I'll, addict. So I'm, I'm curious about like, you know, the differences between watching your friends die then, watching your friends die after you've gotten clean compared to watching your mother pass away um, unrelated to substance use. But this is the other layer here which is that now it's not unreasonable to say that you're likely going to watch your friends die of COVID or of complications related to the impact of COVID socially. I don't know where the question is here. And I know that I'm asking you to go to a pretty deep place and I appreciate you, you know, in advance saying that this was okay to ask you this, but yeah. what do you, like, how are you relating to this? Like how do those, all those past experiences show up now as you're facing the reality of, of watching your friends, what, watching possibly your friends and people unite die of COVID, having given the experiences you've had over the past few decades? Well, from a, a personal perspective, I mean, based upon my previous lifestyle, I'm not sure you'd call them choices, but I'm, I'm roughly 20 years past my expiration date. And every day I don't burst into flames is a good day. So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, statistically speaking, the odds that I would be here right now are, are pretty low. Um, while I was actively using, you know, hard drugs, uh, I've been clinically dead three times that I know about. And that's not so rare. That's a pretty common event amongst individuals. And the, the only one that I really vividly recall and remember and is just kind of like sailing across this this ocean and everything is like these blue black dark waves and everything is really peaceful and you're sort of heading towards this this white light which is kind of like the moon and everything is perfect and then there's like lightning bolts and flames and then shit there are all these demons and I, I what the fuck is this and then then I woke up and uh, and the demons were the EMTs with the Narcan and the defib bringing me back to hell, um, <laughs> which was here. Wow. <laughs> but, um, no, that that was that was that was the only one that I have any recollection of. The others were like, okay, whatever you did, you know, Narcan, defib, you kickstarted your heart, your back, and what happens after those moments when you're strung out is absolutely nothing. The only recollection that I really have is, wow, that was really good. I hope that stamp is still out because I got to get more of that. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and that's an that's an identical response that you will get from pretty much every drug dependent individual. Oh, hey, you were clinically dead or you almost died. Really? Well, that was really good materials. I'd like to get more of them. Um, watching people just cease to exist while you're w living within that lifestyle it becomes something that you're used to and it's sort of you're living in a headspace which is like well you know fuck it i'll be dead by next tuesday anyway and you're used to chaos and instability and the po possibility of death it's a uh, part of active addiction and i think that if you spoke with any given collection of individuals who have survived that all of us have sort of a shared experience of uh i don't know whether you want to call it survivor's guilt or just why am I here when statistically speaking, I should have been dead a long time ago. And why did all these people die? Mm. And okay, so that's active addiction. So you watch a lot of your friends uh, overdose and die. And 
do you really process it at that time? Not so much. You're just viewing that as part of everyday reality. And then moving, moving forward and looking back at all that, what happened to all these people? And uh, a large number of them are, well, they're dead. Uh, some of them are in, in prison for one reason or another. A lot of them are whereabouts unknown. And at, at a certain point in time, I mean, I've made it to, you know, a past half a century. I mean, I'm 51 right now. I, I never thought I'd make it to 18. I never thought I'd make it to 21. It's just like, Okay, here I am. I'm still, I'm still alive. And and when you look look back, I mean, it's never mind the drug dependent individuals. It's just think of people within your own life. And okay, there's one person in particular who I'm going to uh, highlight. Who's a phenomenal human being who was uh, part of. Uh, sort of the Ibogaine world. He was part of the Global Ibogaine Therapists Alliance. His uh, work at Normal in New York was phenomenal, trying to get, you know, cannabis legalized. And uh, he was a good friend for decades. His name was uh, Douglas Green. And he he passed away. And he was in his early 50s, and was not a hard drug user, and he was simply coming back from a concert in the park with his friends. Um, he went to get on a subway, and uh, then he fell in front of the subway as a train was coming, and that was it, the end. And immediately there's did someone push him? Did something happen? Was he on something? And the truth was, no, because you rewind the cameras, there's nowhere, nobody anywhere near him. Uh, what were his health problems? The answers are, you know, nothing uh, tremendous. There's nothing in his system that would have, uh, I mean, he didn't overdose. He didn't, I mean, nobody knows except for the fact that he was really tired because he was constantly working on trying to get legislation passed in New York to legalize cannabis. He was working his day job, which was working for an attorney and he was just tired. He fell in front of a train and okay, here's, this guy I expected to be talking to for decades, who was a good friend of mine, and what were his actual risk factors? Pretty much nothing. He was doing everything right, taking care of his health. He was, and he's gone. That made a huge impact because it was so unexpected. This was, you know, a person who was not in any high risk category whatsoever. And he eventually, he died of exhaustion. He fell asleep in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm. And, you know, my mother is something that's uh, much more complex. And that's something that, I mean, I, I, we talk a lot at different times and I feel very comfortable interacting with you. And, you know, we, by we, I mean, those of us who ended up sort of taking this alternate path through life, I mean, we all have our different backgrounds and our reasons for being that way and uh, a variety of toxic childhoods. And with with my, my mother, I mean, I'm probably not exactly what she would have wanted either. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh Strangely enough, I had sort of the ideal opportunity to to say goodbye to her because she was uh, in her mid 80s uh, over the two, two and a half years leading up to her death. I would get a call from a hospital like roughly four or five times a year. And it was the same call. And it's like, if you ever want to see your mother alive again, get in the car, drive immediately because we're going to lose her. She's, she's going to die. And there's, there's that feeling you get when you're like looking at, at someone who you love, who you have, I mean, the longest relationship with that, you know, you can have with anybody. I mean, she's my mother. Mm -hmm. 
and you know she's she was actually on a respirator multiple times and it's like okay she's this is it and what you're thinking is i i wish i had said these things i wish i had done this if i just had another 5 minutes this is what i would this is what i would do and in my case i had that opportunity about six or seven times in a row for which i am incredibly grateful because it's she's gone but then it's like oh hey we're just kidding not really <laughs> and they keep they keep bringing her back right. so it was like okay she's dead and now she's back off the respirator and i have the nurse walking up and doctor your your mother is like screaming at all of us ripping things out of her telling us we're incompetent and could you tell us what's her usual mental state that sounds about normal for my mom <laughs> yeah. okay yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, so i actually had the best relationship with my mother towards the end that i had had in decades and at the very very end of her life i mean she wasn't there i would i would talk to my mom and it's like where are you when she's in a castle in a really beautiful forest somewhere in the czech republic which is where she was from mm. be so fuck out of being in an icu good for you mom yeah and i mean ultimately i mean she could have lived a few years longer she was completely non-compliant with anything her doctors asked her to do she didn't adhere to any she was a device proof i mean okay she could have made it to 90 instead of 86 but we can't cure old age yet and ultimately that's it was it was what it was but i was very blessed to have that opportunity to say all the things I wanted to say and to be with my mom sort of in the very best state that was, uh, that, that I've been in. And I mean, dying is part of being born so far being born is, uh, you have a 100% chance that it's a, a terminal condition right. thus far. Right, yeah. And if, if anybody has escaped that, they're smart enough to hide so people don't poke them with sticks and try to examine them. <laughs> so, that was, um, so it, 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 I guess to frame all of that into a solid sort of answer, I think it... I mean, death and coming to terms with things and grieving, it depends a lot on where you're at in your own life. If you're in, uh, if you're in a war and you're getting shot at or the world is ending, you probably don't have a whole lot of time to process it right there. And when you're strung out and you're constantly dealing with all these different things, I don't think you deeply process anything at that point that's the stuff that comes raining down on you decades later when you clean up if you do and um psychedelics are certainly very beneficial in coming to terms with the concept of uh, ceasing to exist and from my personal experiences, I have always found ceasing to exist. I mean, ego death, however you want to call it. It's just like, oh, thank God. This is beautiful. This is great. But, you know, then you reintegrate and you kind of come back together and you, we're, we're here again with a different perspective. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Patrick, for going to that vulnerable place with us i feel like there was a lot of learning there for us listening um what do you think uh i mean for me what i sort of like caught in that as i was listening and attempting not to cry as i was feeling into um how you know uh how difficult know. it is you know yeah 
it, it's uh, well, it's it's part of the process of uh, of being alive, and uh, I mean, all of us need to grieve. All of us need to uh, sort of process what's happened and. Even that's not true. A lot of people structure their whole lives so they don't process anything. They try to put everything off so they can ignore it in different ways. And, you know, right now we're in a time where everyone is sort of, uh, you know, experiencing a lot of uh, fear and uncertainty because, you know, the, the, the future is very random. But, um, yeah, I... I, I was grateful for the opportunity to uh, go go through that whole process the way that it actually unfolded because at the end of the day I I had all the opportunities I had all the chances that I wanted to reconnect to say everything to do everything and um Finally, I mean, it was, you know, I, I even had, uh, you know, basically the, at a certain point, uh, you know, people are no longer fit to make judgments regarding their own uh, medical care. And I didn't have to do anything. I mean, I, I always just went with whatever it is that she wants. That's great. I mean, and uh, there, there wasn't it's just okay this time was was the end and just accepting that and and processing it that was so. mm -hmm. why don't we just like um, uh take a breather i'm gonna make this a point that we cut the show for a second and then we'll jump back in so all right. from this point on we're not recording so <laughs> all right yeah. well i uh, that's the first time I've, uh, you know, talked about that. So that was, it was, uh, that was difficult, but not, it was, it was a good thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well maybe, maybe we'll leave that, this, that last bit of the recording in. Um, cause as I'm listening, um, I'm hearing from you, like, I'm hearing you sharing with me something that you learned in through direct experience, which is that um, having the opportunity to be clear of mind and recognizing what's happening prior to it having happened gave you um, gave you the ability to relate to relate to your mom and have the experiences you needed that you can carry with for the rest of your life to say the things that you needed to say and so on and so forth, that if you were still on heroin, you wouldn't have been able to do just like you couldn't do with your friends that were dying back then. Right. No. And no, that don't process. Right. And so, and, and with psychedelics, there's a greater perception, like a greater capacity to recognize like, Whoa, all of this is coming up and I'm in it. And instead of being like, I got to find a way to get the hell out of it. I mean, psychedelics force you to learn how to just be in it. Um, and so I'm listening to that and I'm, and I'm hearing these things and I'm, I'm wondering about what does that mean in so far as all of us right now, we don't know where we are. We know we have a sense of where we are, but we have no idea where we're going right now, except for what the examples have been in countries that have already been headed hard. And if we're headed in that direction, it's not a pretty picture. We're headed in the direction of a lot of people we care about, especially our parents, likely dying and likely dying in a way where we won't get to hold their hand or hug them goodbye. Yeah. And so I'm hearing the value we have in recognizing what might be coming to say the things that we wanted to say and not make each other enemies under, underneath all this stress, you know, and not to hide um, from what might be coming because we don't know yet. And now is not an opportunity to waste. That's a beautiful way to frame it and to say what 
is also my truth. I would I would absolutely agree with you because I uh, I think all of us have a family that are still alive who are in the much higher risk category than we are. And coming together and just reaching out and connecting with people and uh, letting them know. Yeah. And just. Yeah. Maybe we should let's shift trajectories um, a little bit and maybe uh, come back come back to shore um, because I'm not sure what value it is to go any further into that than we already have um, without us like grieving together. Probably good to do that in advance for the people who are going to die. You know, it's like get the, get the practice in. Um, but uh, yeah, why don't, why don't we, why don't, why don't we, why don't we call it here? Um, I mean, it's sort of weird. Now I'm like, how do people follow more of what you do? I feel like that's feels so trivial to ask you, even though that's typically what I ask at the end of a podcast. Um, uh, but like, what, what do you feel is like, what do you, Patrick, what do you feel like you would like to, at the end of this, at the end of this podcast, what do you feel like you would like to leave the people listening, um, with? Well, it's really beautiful looking outside my window. It's snowing right now. Probably it, it does a lot of that where you're at right now. Well, it's, it's not snowing right now, but it has been snowing all morning. So, yeah. I just try to drop all the shit and don't worry about it. Focus on your heart if you can. And if you can't, then just focus on anything until you can turn your brain down until you can make your mind uh, not upset you about what's happening with the world because the world will keep going. Uh, share love with those around you that you care about. Let them know that they are loved. And um, come, come together with your friends and your family because we're all part of the same community. We're all part of this world. And all of us are going through exactly the same thing. And um, much love to everybody who is listening to us, everybody who is part of our lives. And try to experience joy. What, what teaches me joy are things that are very random and completely outside of myself. I mean, I have a... I have a, a puppy who's like six months old, and every morning that's complete chaos. Every day that's complete chaos. He just like runs in. He's ridiculously thrilled. He's a German shepherd. He's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's like, okay, you just stole a bunch of shit out of my office, and there went this, and there went that. And he doesn't know about COVID. He doesn't care. He's, he's happy. It's um, just experience being human. Don't feel obligated to listen to doom coming in on the internet 24 hours a day. Just shut the shit down and do something that makes you happy and brings you into a better space and brings you around those that you love. And if that is FaceTime or video or whatever, then do that. But just, you know, you're not I don't think any of us were obligated to listen to bad news 24 hours a day. It'll still be there when we get back to it. If you're, <laughs> if you're sitting in... yeah. <laughs> That's one thing we can rely on right now. <laughs> if we're sitting in our houses, I mean, it's like, the, what is it that you're going to miss in the four or five hours you're not paying attention? Don't go outdoors in groups. Don't, I mean, just try to relax and be human and be well and... This too will pass. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Patrick, for your time today, for opening up so vulnerably about such um, sensitive, but also incredibly important um, and relevant topics uh, today for us to hold on to. 
um, and I truly and sincerely hope you safety um, and uh, throughout the course of this this pandemic uh, as it rolls out in our world. The the same to you, my friend, and thank you for for having me on and strange timing because of course the entire planet is focused on this one thing that we spent a lot of time talking about and it was uh it was great to have the opportunity to share and uh hear your thoughts and experience uh what we're going through uh the, this whole journey is very interesting and i I'm very hopeful for a positive outcome for all of us. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Cheers. And cut. Okay, that is this episode now. Thank you very much for listening. Um, as you heard at the very, very, very beginning before the intro, um, Patrick was not intending to encourage you to physically go out and visit your family and friends, uh, but digitally, um, practicing as much social distancing and uh, very tight controls of your interactions as much as possible to, of course, as we talked about, and have, as you've heard many times now, flatten the curve, flatten the curve and prevent the continuous spread of this illness. But either way, very much so encouraging to connect with the people that you love. Um... If you'd like to support the show, you could share this with a friend. That'd be really great. If you're not impacted economically by the COVID-19 pandemic and you would like to contribute financially to the show, the best way to do that is through Patreon, which you can do uh, by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso or head to jameswgesso.com forward slash support to see different options that exist there uh, to financially support the show. So I will see you in about two weeks from now when we will both, uh, when we will all be, I imagine, in an incredibly different world than, than even a few days ago, um, even possibly radically different um, from the time I record this to the time that it releases. Um, but I truly and honestly hope and wish for you and your family and your loved ones and their loved ones and their families um, safety in this time. So... Thanks, and I'll see you in the next episode. Take care.